Hi, thanks so much for inviting me. The person who was actually uh, going to stand here is Reinhard Wiers, who is a professor for experimental psychology in um, the Netherlands. And we used to be collaborators when I was still a PhD student in, uh, in Germany. And he also turned out to be my faraway cousin from Holland. So he said, oh, well, you're a Wiers too. You can, uh, you can present it for me. <laughs> you can see it. <laughs> but I'm actually mainly presenting my data. So right now I'm, I work at the um, NIAAA in Bethesda, but I mainly talk about um, my findings from my PhD in Germany, namely the neural effects of cognitive bias modification training in alcohol addiction. <coughs> and a small uh, background in alcohol addiction. Well, people start drinking for many reasons, of course, because they really like the feeling or they want to get rid of the negative feeling, like anxiety. But um, over the course of um, alcohol taking, there's this central paradox in addictive behaviors, namely the continuation of drug use despite negative consequences. And you can see this from the very high relapse uh, rates. So in uh, alcohol addiction alone, over 80% over of people who explicitly say they want to quit uh, cannot. They find themselves over and over again to, to drink. Um, and in the more cognitive neuroscience literature, there's this dual process model of addiction that on the one hand, if um, alcohol um, or patients with alcohol use disorder, if they're exposed to cues that remind them of alcohol, they're, um, they're more overactive for the reward system um, comes into place in the, mainly in the central striatum, medial prefrontal cortex, and amygdala, whereas uh, there's this proposed less active reflective system, mainly in the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. Uh, and if you see the empirical evidence for this dual process model, um, just behaviorally, if you confront uh, alcohol patients with cues that remind them of alcohol, they say, yeah, more roughly say, yeah, this induces craving in me, but um, this finding has been relatively inconsistent. And uh, in the 90s, this was already, they, they thought, well, probably craving is more an unconscious process and cannot be reported verbally. So in um, your, Im in your imaging studies, it has been shown that if you uh, just passively view alcohol cues in people who like alcohol or people who don't like alcohol or people with an alcohol use disorder, that um, alcohol cues versus most of the time neutral or soft drink cues, um, that areas related to reward are more active, whereas dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex has been shown to be less active uh, compared to controls and compared to neutral cues. Um, and third, in experimental psychology, there's um, a wealth of literature on automatic biases. So in the one, uh, one bias that has been measured is the intentional, uh, intentional bias for drug use and also the approach bias for drug use. And the intentional bias um, for alcohol can be measured with this visual probe task. So a participant just sits behind a computer and they see two cues, a non-alcohol cue and an alcohol cue, and there's a dot below it, and you just have to press left or right depending on where the dot is. And it has been shown that um, when the dot is under the alcohol cue, that alcohol use disorder patients that respond faster to that one because they already had an increased attention towards these alcohol cues. And another bias that has been uh, studied more recently is the approach bias um, on this approach avoidance task. You have a joystick and a computer, and the instruction for participants is that if you uh, see a picture in uh, or a landscape format, then you push as fast as possible with this joystick. And if you see it in portrait fo format, then you pull as fast as possible. But this is, of course, counterbalanced. Um, and if, yeah, so for example, if you see a cue like this, you push it as fast as possible, and here you would pull it. And the task itself would also have a zooming effect because otherwise you wouldn't find the approach bias effect, namely that if you push it away, the cue becomes very small, and if you put it towards you, the cue becomes very large. So it's a representation of avoidance and approach. And the approach bias is calculated by the reaction time of um, pushing minus pulling. So the larger this um, approach bias score, the stronger your automatic tendency to approach a certain cue type. And the first person who showed this in alcohol was Reinhardt in Amsterdam. 
who um, showed that the that heavy drinkers show increased automatic tendencies um, of pulling towards the least, the least cues of alcohol compared to soft drinks cues. Um, so a faster approach versus avoid um, those specific alcohol cues. And this has now been replicated also in alcohol dependent patients, in smokers, marijuana users, um, and you also see it in heroin abusers. That was um, a study from China. Um, yeah, so for these, of course, not alcohol cues, but they're all drug related cues. So marijuana leaks or just joints and so on um, are being pushed, you know, pulled faster than pushed. So the research question that I worked on in my PhD thesis is, well, what are the neural processes underlying this automatic uh, approach bias for alcohol? And the hypotheses were that, of course, uh, we wanted to replicate this behavioral finding of a larger or stronger approach bias for alcohol stimuli in alcohol dependent patients, um, and also that this approach bias would be associated with increased um, and increased reward-related areas, whereas less active uh, dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. And what I did there in Berlin was um, inviting 20 alcohol-dependent patients into the lab and 17 healthy controls, and they're all matched for age, education, and handedness. So the only uh, variable that they were different on was um, was alcohol use. Um, and we measured them in the three Tesla fMRI scanner with this approach avoidance task while lying down. Of course you have to. For some people they were a little bit too big so we couldn't so we couldn't do this joystick experiment. But um, yeah, so participants were in there on the screen, they saw these cues and had to push and pull. And um, during these scans we were just measuring their bulk responses. And the main measure of interest was for both the reaction time and the bulk response is interaction between drink types times movement times group. And the results show uh, a replication of this behavioral effect, namely an interaction effect between this patient or uh, group times mm, the type of cue. And if you look post hoc, you see that the differences were mainly for the alcohol cues. So alcohol dependent patients had stronger approach bias compared to healthy controls for alcohol cues. <coughs> and also, if you look at the interaction of pulling versus pushing alcohol versus pulling versus pushing soft drinks, we saw that the right hip recombinant was activated and also the medial prefrontal cortex. But we didn't see any evidence for the amygdala in this group uh, comparison. Um, but we, the, in the reverse context, we didn't see any um, less active dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And then when we ran the correlation analysis, we did see that uh, only in alcohol-dependent patients who showed uh, or that the amygdala was uh, associated with their explicit, explicit ratings of craving. <coughs> so a uh, summary of this first study is that the automatic alcohol approach bias involves the nucleus accumbens and medial prefrontal cortex, but we didn't find evidence for um, a less active dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And we also found a correlation um, between amygdala activation and alcohol craving. Um, so thus, um, we would suggest that there's a more active motivational system active for the alcohol approach bias, but no support for a less active control system. Um, and the, here are the studies from Reinhardt who come into place. Can this alcohol approach bias be treated? And he uh, published a paper in 2011 on the clinical effects of cognitive bias modification training using this approach avoidance task. And um, this yeah, CBM, or cognitive bias modification training, in his trial, um, participants underwent six times two, 200 trials of this sp specific task. And the instruction was exactly the same. Just push a um, horizontal cue and pull a vertical cue. Um, but in the CVM um, version, the, the task was manipulated in a way that the alcohol cues were pushed in 90% of the cases. Not 100%, so the, it was still relatively implicit what, were, what they were doing, 
um, but still in the majority of the cases, um, alco alcohol patients were pushing away these alcohol cues. Whereas in the placebo or sham condition, it was just the, the approach of avoidance task with 50% pushing alcohol and 50% pulling alcohol all along. And the soft drink was then reversed for the cognitive bias modification. So the, um, in the training task, patients were just selectively learning to push away alcohol cues. And what they found and what also has been um, replicated now, so in the first study this was in heavy alcohol users, so they found decreased approach bias scores. If you learn to just push away and eventually you are being tested on this approach avoidance task, then you have um, lower approach biases for alcohol because you've just learned to push it away. Uh, and this also generalized to new stimuli. So if you're trained on say 40 cues and on the test task you uh, just show different types of alcohol cues, for example, this effect was still there. Um, <coughs> further, in heavy drinkers, they showed lower alcohol consumption. So heavy drinkers were doing just one session of this training, and they showed that afterwards they were doing a, a beer taste te test, um, and the drinkers just drank less beer after this training. Uh, but very relevant in alcohol-dependent patients or in clinical settings, it also lowered relapse rates up to 13%. So Miranda was the first one in 2011, and this was replicated in the same clinic. It's in the same, in the same clinic by Carolyn Abel and Mike Rink, which is now in uh, preparation. Um, yeah, so I found it very interesting, and I uh, went to Germany to actually answer this question, what are the neural effects of this bias modification training? And the hypothesis here was also a stronger decrease in this motivational system when uh, alcohol patients were viewing alcohol cues after training versus before, and also in the training versus in the placebo training. And I specifically looked at the nucleus accumbens and amygdala because both these areas already showed um, decreases by uh, <laughs> various in, in various uh, treatment studies. So I think the false decline was someone who did an exposure to therapy in alcohol use disorder patients, uh, where Snyder used a pharmacological agent. But at least these two areas were receptive to, to any change or to any therapy. Um, so I used a very, very basic alcohol cure activity task, a block design, six blocks of uh, alcohol cues. Now these are mainly German cues or popular German drinks, and um, the soft drink cues. It's some American influences <laughs> too. I checked that. Um, so the design, the uh, patients came into the lab. We started with uh, 36 alcohol-dependent patients and underwent this cure activity task. Then they went back into their clinic, and uh, um, 18 patients underwent CBM training, and the other uh, patients underwent this placebo training, and of course it was uh, blind to them uh, what they were doing, also blind to the, to the therapist who actually gave these trainings to them. Um, and they did this training for three weeks, and we, uh, yeah, we used exactly the same ratio, so 90-10 versus 50-50. And three weeks later they came back uh, again for this cure activity, but instead of 36 we only had 32 because four people dropped out. So we had 15 versus 17 as a final sample, uh, but they were still matched for all these measures. Um, so the behavioral results, we did see trends-wise that in the CBM training um, the approach bias scores decreased, but, it, but there was not a, or there no significant interaction effect of time times group, and this may be because it's just a, such a small sample size. Um, but on a neural level, we found that at the um, uh, time point one, that in over throughout the whole group, there was increased activation in uh, the nucleus accumbens and in the amygdala for alcohol cues versus um, soft drink cues. And if you look pre and post, we saw a stronger decrease in the CBM group, which is plotted positively here versus the uh, placebo training group, so in the amygdala. So the amygdala, the amygdala, there was a decrease in activation of the training. 
placebo, exactly. And also this decrease in amygdala activation correlated with decreases in craving responses. There was actually a main effect of craving. Both groups after three weeks said, oh yeah, we crave alcohol less, which you would expect if they are also in other behavioral therapies. They also did it on the side. Um, but only in the CBM group did this decrease in amygdala also correlate with uh, decreases in craving. <coughs> So a summary of these neural effects of CBM, we didn't find a behavioral effect, but at least we showed first evidence that the CBM can reduce alcohol cue evokes um, amygdala activation and is correlated with craving. So cognitive bias modification may reduce the salience of alcohol cues, which may be a key underlying mechanism of its therapeutic effectiveness. But of course, this was the first study out there in, uh, in alcohol addiction, very low sample size, and this needs to be replicated in much larger samples. We did also do a study in only 13 versus 13 um, or CBM versus placebo, uh, but there we looked at the pre and post activation of this approach avoidance task, and there we showed a decrease in medial prefrontal cortex activation only in the CBM group and not in the placebo group. Uh, and this was associated with the approach avoidance um, score, so the, the bias itself, but not with craving. <coughs> so conclusion, um, there's an overactive reward system involved in, the, in this alcohol approach bias, and we show first evidence that um, CBM can affect mesolimbic brain activity, and a reduction of this mesolimbic cure activity may be an underlying mechanism of this therapeutic effectiveness of CBM. And uh, in the last few months, uh, we finally have a Beers and Beers uh, paper in <laughs> that's currently in revision. I still owe you the revision. So. Um, but we just reviewed the literature on the neural effects of CBM. And until now, there are actually only nine studies in an anx uh, anxious behavior, only two studies in depressive behavior and two of our studies in addiction and they all have very small sample sizes and the results are all over the place but for example uh, Jennifer Britton who's now in uh, Florida also showed decreased amygdala activation for emotional faces after uh, CBM in anxiety for example so amygdala activation may be something that is, uh, is involved in this um, but yeah, we definitely need more replication, also in different uh, study groups. The reason that we only did it in alcohol was that in Germany you're not allowed to do any human studies in uh, illicit drug users, for example, so we had to stick to, to alcohol. But Reinhardt also works on smokers, and he also showed that in a clinical trial with heavy smokers that there was also a decrease in, um, in relapse, uh, but it's not out yet. Um, yeah, so the economist was very optimistic about CBM, they put the psychiatrist scouts out of the business. <laughs> I don't think it would ever work like that, but at least it is a promising measure or a promising therapy that can actually tackle these unconscious processes in, uh, in addiction. And many thanks to my previous uh, PhD advisors, Felix Bernpo and Henrik Bauter, and my uh, collaborator, Reinhard Wiers. Um, and currently, I work in the lab of Nora Volkov, also in the lab for the last year. So she is an amazing mentor. And I actually started doing uh, <laughs> that research now, so, other than you, Diana. So thank you. And if you have any questions, let me know.